What's up, whiskey lovers? Welcome back to this week's episode of Whiskey Talks, where we talk to people involved from farm to mouth on all things whiskey. And today, um, we've got Mr. Johnny Walker Blue himself is talking to us. Um, Shane, thank you for joining us, mate. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. So, if no one knows who this gentleman is, I will share his Instagram right here. And um, you'll be able to see him. He has got a massive following, um, has been involved with whiskey for many, many, many years. Yeah. And this here is only a small collection of what he's got um, behind us. He's got three other rooms in his house and he's got more in storage. And I'm not going to tell you where he lives as well. So, mate. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us. No worries. Thanks. So, what. <sighs> there's so many questions. I I'm just looking around this room and there's so <laughs> many fucking questions. Well, let's start at the start. What got you into whiskey? Jeez, let's go on back now. I think uh, about 14 years ago, as we all do, you know, I started drinking when I was about 17 years old. So started on the premix cans and then got sick of doing the premix. So I just bought my own bottle and started mixing it myself. And then when I turned between 18 and 20, I really started getting into the single malts. Bought my first bottle of Blue Label and then sort of broke it down into all the different single malts that went into it. And then it just snowballed from there. It's um, a pretty expensive snowball. It is, especially <laughs> at that age. You know, I was only doing an apprenticeship, so I wasn't earning that much money. You know, I was still living at home and stuff like that, which always helped. But uh, yeah, it wasn't wasn't cheap, especially 14 years ago. You know, whiskey prices were different to what they are now. And obviously, wages were as well. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, so the first bottle of Johnny Blue was at your birthday party, correct? 21 years old. Yeah, I had yep. a lot of a lot of friends at that party. So. And uh, how many? Uh, <laughs> what was the? There was a bit of disgust at the, at the, from family. Yeah, yeah. I remember my uh, a couple of people were disgusted that I'd spend three hundred dollars on a, a bottle at the age of twenty one, and I had no concept of money. And my old man didn't talk to me for a couple of days, if I remember correctly. But the things have changed now. Which the, the amount of places that whiskey have taken me, and even my old man, just just because of whiskey. So. I bet he's changed his tune now. <laughs> There's not many times you can say <laughs> drinking alcohol has made me, you know, wealthy or, you know, got us involved into... Trouble the world. In trouble right? the world and some of that. So, so you've gone from, um, uh, from that and you were an apprentice. What were you doing originally? Originally, I was working at a uh, water treatment plant of all places. So it certainly wasn't the, uh, the right job that I ever wanted to do. And it was sort of one of those things that I did for 10 years, actually. And it got to the point where I'd just wake up every morning and you know, geez, I don't want to do this anymore and I don't want to go to work. And then one day I just quit and then decided to get a job in the whiskey world, which was pretty much impossible in Australia, but I ended mm. up scoring a It was either International Airport or it was Dan Murphy. So like the two job choices at the time. And I applied for both and ended up scoring a job at the International Airport and climbed the ladder and ended up running their uh, whiskey tasting bar in mm. the departure store. So. so that was Brisbane? Brisbane, yeah. So anyone that has left Brisbane internationally, more likely you have met this man Probably before me, yep. um, through that. So... Yeah, working at Dan's, not that fulfilling probably. Um, no. Stocking shelves and talking about people exactly. with whiskey, you know, might get a bit of a discount, but probably not enough to make it worthwhile. What was kind of, uh, you said you started from the bottom at the, at the airport and worked your way up. How long ago was that? Like, and what was the journey through that? Um, and what kind of training did you get with getting the job and, and all those kind of things? So basically, I think I started the airport job about five years ago. So I haven't been there for about a year and a half now. And when I first started there, there was no whiskey tasting bar. So I just started on the floor as, you know, people would come through and want whiskey suggestions. So I'd just be like, hey, you know, this and this. And then eventually they opened a whiskey bar and it was just like, you're the guy for that. And I just slid straight into it. And uh, because I had such whiskey knowledge, I started, ended up training the staff at the, at the duty free store and stuff like that. So I started from there and then built the way up to the, to the whiskey bar. But all my knowledge is basically self-taught, self looked into it, studied it myself. And then basically I ended up uh, hosting tastings and stuff like that at the airport as well. So like brand ambassadors would come through and then I'd do their training for their staff and stuff like that. Right. So it, it ended up real well to, to, to give me even more knowledge now. So that kind of started realistically the, the explosion that you've got now of being able to have that much access to alcohol and things like that. Definitely. Yep. But also huge social media following because obviously you started off with the local bottles and things like that. And now you've got your own kind of collection with exactly. it as well. Yeah. What, um, what's kind of the highlight of that job that you've had? So it might have been some people that you've had come through or the training or a bottle. Actually, we'll ask that one later on, but maybe the people or the training or the events and stuff like that that happened during the time that you've worked at there. Definitely. So I'd get a lot of, uh, because, you know, Brisbane International Airport, such a, a big things for, for companies. They had, um, 
I remember one day I was just doing a night shift and I, and I was standing at the whiskey tasting bar and I said to one of my colleagues, I'm just like, I'm pretty sure that's, uh, that's Jim McEwen from Brook Laddie standing mm. over there and they're just like, no, nah, no way. And I'm just like, I bet it is. And I walked over and I'm just like, excuse me, Jim McEwen. And it was. <laughs> and he was flying back from, uh, he'd, he'd been down in Byron Bay and he was helping them out down there to make gin and stuff like that. Right. So like just seeing random people like that. And um, that's also where I met Will from Bladnock as well. So meet, meet all these people that have come through and, you know, Glenn Farkless guys come through and all the brand ambassadors for Glenfiddich and Belvinia. So <laughs> it kind of like really built me a, a good network of, of meeting people. Yeah. That's probably the easiest way to meet people, isn't it? They, yeah. They're actually coming to you instead of you coming to them in a way. So. Exactly, and they're, and they're all coming for a drink, so it's, it's perfect. Yeah, it's you know, even easier to make everyone, it, everyone, good connections when everyone's drinking as well. Everyone's having a pre-flight drink. And then it kind of s- snowballed into the fact that uh, I started going to Scotland a lot, so I started going to the London Whiskey Festival. This year would have been my fifth year in a row actually going to the London Whiskey Festival, but uh, you know, COVID <laughs> ruined that. And because I met so many contacts through the airport, I just sent an email off saying, hey, I'm going to be in Scotland, what's the chances of, you know, a whiskey tour or something like that? And then they just organise all these great things for me and then it just got even more content and the, the following grew. I can tell you a ton of people watching this video are super fucking jealous, including myself, about that. <laughs> um, so, best bottle then that ever came through Duty Free that you kind of, you drooled over, maybe could never, okay, one you'll never be able to afford. Um, and I don't, I, can't, I don't remember the duty free how if their prices were insane or in that, or if you had really good special yeah, bottles, bit of hit and miss. Or, or one that you kind of went, yeah, this is really special, and it was like an everyday person's kind of whiskey. What's the kind of? Because there's a lot of duty free exclusives, isn't there? There is, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot. Pretty much one of the holy grails that uh, it sat there for a very long time, but it ended up selling. I think it was uh, eleven thousand dollars was the thirty three year old Port Ellen. Okay. Which was, it, I would love to have owned that bottle. Hmm. That was kind of the the out of reach one but uh other than that we had a lot of like more affordable things you know that was like the brook laddie 27 year old you know there was the belvini 21 madeira cast when it first came out so it was kind of annoying that i was so close to all of these bottles that i could never buy them and then i started meeting friends that would well not friends but like people that come through that i became friends with that were regular travelers and i'd just be like hey can you buy this for me <laughs> and they're just like sure not a problem I'm not using my allowance anyway so yeah. then i all of a sudden had access to all of these duty-free bottles as well yeah. so anything under 500 bucks was sort of easy to get but the holy grail would have been the port ellen 33 for, right. for the airport and then yeah. that, that, i think they had a crag and more 43 year old and a couple other rare ones as well. so that, that one there was that a, a duty-free exclusive or is that something you can get I don't think it was a duty free exclusive, but no one else would take on such an expensive bottle. Yeah. Back then, anyway. Yeah. So it was kind of like you would only get it in Brisbane or Sydney yep. International Airport. So this, and that's a funny thing too. Like I've only really discovered um, Kiwana, uh Dan Murphy's, and Mermaid Beach. Uh, Mermaid, Mermaid what is Mermaid Beach? Yes. Um, Dan Murphy's that they actually have like a dedicated whiskey thing, and they that's have ten thousand dollar, eleven thousand dollar bottles of whiskey. Where I've been to Dan Murphy's at Champside and all those other places in the city and so that you don't have any of those kind of things. So yeah, seeing something definitely. like that in your face is pretty bloody awesome. Oh, no, right. um, so yeah, seeing it, seeing your work there every day, that'll be even harder. So And not only that, I was kind of in, in charge of like cleaning them and maintaining them as well. So, you know, I'd be like mm. lifting this glass thing off and I'm holding like an $11,000 bottle and I'm trying to make it look presentable and it was kind of nerve wracking when you know something's that expensive in your, in your hands. So I've got to ask then, most expensive stuff up there. Where? Any break? Any breaks oh. that are duty free? <sighs> I've seen ones that you can admit that you, know, you no longer now work there. <laughs> when I when I first started, I'd only been there for five days, and the the most expensive break I ever had was I dropped a bottle of the uh, Jemison Vintage that was worth six hundred dollars. Okay, and it was my I think it was my fifth day, and it just bang exploded, and I was basically ready to. I was like, all right, I'll just <laughs> see you later. I'll and pack up my stuff and go. Yeah, yeah, and now it's like, no, 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 it's okay. Everyone has one, and it's covered by an insurance, and I was like. Oh, that's, sweet. that's good <laughs> but i have seen someone drop and smash the uh the john walker that was about three and a half thousand at duty free that is gone by a, a buyer or a uh sort of customer customer back just knocked it tipped it with a bag and smashed and just didn't care less i just sort of looked at it and just went wow yeah covered by insurance hopefully. covered by insurance okay yeah. well that's yeah. good but sometimes though i wanted to drink it off the floor yeah i was gonna just start put a rag in there and just <laughs> drip it in but even though like if if there's so many special bottles that you'll never repeat again that even if they are in trouble or like covered by insurance it's not around anymore it's exactly. like you know it's only in people's collections and stuff so 
looking, I'm, I'm just looking, if you see my eyes not even looking at Shane, you're looking at these bottles and stuff on the side here, which you can't see, but like, <laughs> why Johnny Blue? Like, uh, like we kind of spoke about it before, but why? We're so, or Johnny Walker, not even just Johnny Blue. We're, we're so much Johnny Walker here. Yeah. It basically, you know, it's not necessarily that I always drink the Johnny Walker. It's kind of that I just started collecting it and... When they bring out a limited edition, they always make it the blue. Be clever marketing yeah. that you know everyone's going to spend more to to get the limited edition. But uh, you know, once I started and it sort of got out of hand, I, I couldn't really stop. So, how many bottles do you think you've got of Johnny Walker? <sighs> oh, geez, last count was three hundred and sixty-three. I don't even have that in my own collection of everything. I think I've got one hundred and twelve or something like that. And I that believe is insane. I believe just under half are blue label editions. So yeah. it's it's a lot of blue. So would you say that you've got one of the biggest Johnny Blue collections in Australia? Well, unofficially, according to the to the you know the Johnny Walker groups and stuff like that, mine's the biggest Johnny Walker collection in Australia and unofficially the third biggest in the world. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone wants to dispute that, I'm happy to to see it. But yeah. as far as I know that's that's what people are saying. So I'm just like, oh if anyone wants to send some more Johnny Walker blue bottles over so he can be number one in the world, that would be awesome. Yeah, so, so, there's is there a special bottle um, in here or is there a special Johnny Walker blue bottle or a Johnny Walker bottle for you that just kind of goes, you kind of look at it and go, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a couple of couple of Holy Grails. There's, um, they, they made a Johnny Walker for me as well. So Get it down. They, they took away the, uh, you might be closer to it. Okay, grab, grab, grab no, I don't want to knock anything down, so I'll be very <laughs> gentle. So they actually uh, took pictures of me and then made me into the striding man. So that that was like a limited edition they made for me because they want Diageo wanted to, to make a bottle that was going to be unique for my collection. And what's more unique than me is the striding man. That is awesome. So, <laughs> so front, do you know who the people on the sides are? No. No? Okay, cool. So they're probably some <laughs> other, Just, maybe, I oh know he looks like a soccer player. I oh know he's, he's... Could, could be a soccer player. He looks, no. he looks famous. Wow. Okay. There we go. Well, how awesome is that having a bottle with your own face and well whole body walk uh, walking on a, on a Johnny Walker thing so that's pretty cool that's definitely one of my uh, favorites for, for the collection yeah and what about the like a it doesn't even have to be a Johnny Blue but you've got obviously like the XR here you've got a lot of the 15 year old which I, the sherry finish which I've never seen before um, you know what, what what other special bottle is there that you've got in the collection so, Could be from a family friend or something like that. So basically the other Holy Grail that I've got that, that a lot of people know about is actually one sitting right behind me here, which is this guy. Okay. So this is called the Robbie Burns edition. I'll let you show it, mate. All right. Got gentle hands. <laughs> so the Robbie Burns edition, there's basically only about, as far as I know, four to exist in the world. And two have actually passed my hand. So that I, I sold one, which I shouldn't have, to a mm. collector in, uh, in Australia, funny enough. So... There's two in Australia and two somewhere else in the world, but I believe in 2009 they had a Robbie Burns dinner. As you know, Robbie Burns is a big day in Scotland. And uh, in Edinburgh they had a huge big dinner of 200 people for the Robbie Burns Day and they, they invited, you know, the high people of high, high society in Edinburgh, doctors, lawyers or anyone that sort of contributed to society in Edinburgh. And um, when you got to the table, this bottle was your invite. So you'd sit down and the bottle was there and it had your name on it and it had all this stuff. So basically, when everyone sat down, that was their bottle for the night. So they'd all start drinking their invitation. So out of the 200 people that were invited, as far as I know, there was about four people that didn't drink that took their bottles home. So it's, wow. it's something that can never, ever be replaced, replicated. It was never sold. So about I've only ever seen two go to auction, and they're the two that I've won. So wow. basically, that's one of three other bottles in the world that someone didn't drink and I've got the name tag the lady on mine was Rachel someone and she was a lawyer from Edinburgh and obviously didn't drink and then sold it at auction and I bought it and hmm. that's one that everyone wants wow there yeah, we go so, so, so if you're a Johnny Blue lover and you don't know about that I, I had no idea about that I never heard about that before so that's pretty cool but the yeah. ironic thing is is just inside is just standard blue label it's just the packaging and the limited edition yeah. and all that that makes it slowly but uh, let's talk about that and not even about what you've got and what we normally drink ourselves but a lot of the time it is about the packaging isn't it that makes valuable valuable whiskies Definitely, yeah. um you know the way they they put the box or the way they put a print on it or they put the bottle tops and stuff of that um, and stuff like that's, that that's it yeah but it's the same liquid exactly at the end of the day yeah it's interesting how couple little things but that's marketing that's what i do you know part of my job is marketing, marketing. yeah marketing is absolutely awesome with it so 
So if, you, if we, you've done a lot, you spent a lot of time in the UK, uh, or have, obviously you're not at the moment. Um, you said you went to a lot of the whiskey, like the whiskey event over there. Have you done many of the ones in Australia? Yeah, every year I've been doing Brisbane Whiskey Live. I've done the Sydney one a couple of times, and uh, I still haven't been to the uh, Dramfest in New Zealand, which makes me sad. Yep. But uh, I saw I saw photos and videos of people at uh, Dramfest last time. Yeah, and it's, it was, yeah, it was yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I need to be there next year for sure. So. Definitely. And it was kind of like one of those things that you know I was flying all the way across the world to go to all these big events, and there's such a great event so close to home that I'd never been to. So, kind of disappointed in myself that I haven't been there, but it's very high on my list now. Yeah. But, well, I think with everything that's going with COVID and some of that, the bubble might happen where I think we're opening up to Hawaii soon and New that. Zealand might yeah. be the, you know, so hopefully we can get that bubble back again with New Zealand. It would be um, a good place to go. So let's try and look at this. And it's a question I ask everybody. Um, what are you currently drinking at the moment? Do you, what's like, what's your go currently go-to whiskey? So right now my go-to would be the Black Knock 26. And I know you've been drinking it as well. Yep. So Blood Knock 26, uh, I'm a big fan of the 17, but then I've also been alternating between the, uh, the Glendronic Port cask at the moment, and I've also been drinking a bit of the, uh, what was it, the uh, Winter Storm in the Glenfiddich. Okay, yep. yeah. So okay. They're, they're sort of my alternating between at the and moment. They're, they're very different, I haven't had the Winter Storm at Glenfiddich, but um, they're very different to the 17 year old Blood Knock, aren't they? They are. Yeah, okay, cool, because it's the, the the Blood Knock 17 has, if you've seen many of these and anything else, I always rave about it. It's my my ultimate favourite whiskey. Mine too. There's stuff That's... all left yeah, I know. Um, in Australia. Um, I'm putting a little side fun to buy about five bottles very shortly. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting that you've got such a variance of ones that you generally go to all the time. And the 26 year old Blood Knock is, again, it's amazing as well. So, so when... Um, when you uh, when you're tasting whiskies or, or trying a new whiskey and, and obviously nosing it, what are you really looking for? What are the kind of features of a whiskey that you really enjoy? So basically, if I'm looking at a new whiskey, you know, I, I try and look for you know a unique cask or, or a higher strength, you know, something to set it apart from from the standard thing. But I always sort of take my notes on on the nose and then I, I gather what I think I can smell and take and like what it's going to taste like and then. If I'm really getting into it, you know, I'll write down a couple of notes, you know, I get this on the nose, it's floral, I get the red wine cask, and then I'll taste it, and then that's kind of how, if I'm posting about it as well, you know, I'll get my sort of review that I'm doing, but I always make sure that I take two sips, as you've yeah. probably heard me say a couple of times, you know, the first sip always shocks the taste buds, it's the, it's the second sip that you can really gauge the taste and flavour, mm. and then I'll do it with a drop of water, and I'll do it without a drop of water, just so I can get the, the two comparisons, because a drop of water does always change whiskey. Yeah. So when I do all that, I can say, well, I really enjoyed it with the drop of water. So that's how I'm going to sort of drink that one from now on and then compose all my notes. And so I, I talking about that, I just did a Paul John Brilliance. It's oh, the first nice. time I've ever had Indian whiskey. Yep. Um, didn't enjoy it. Didn't, didn't like it. And then I put some water with it. It's such high Absolutely strength, fucking enjoyed it. It's just like... Yeah, it is such an enjoyable whiskey with just a bit of water in there. Yep. Really opens it up. And I'm like, because I was doing the review, I'm like... Oh, I'm not too sure if I really enjoy this. And then all of a sudden put the water in there and went, oh my God. And yeah. like, it is just so funny about how obviously that's chemistry and stuff like that, not bringing the oils and things like that, that it just completely changes. 100%. You know, and it is something that I always try and do is, is have water with every whiskey. So we're drinking at the moment, Christie's Cut, the Tim Boone, which is a 60%, which is obviously a high one. It's Australian one. I've had them on the, on the whiskey talks before as well. Um, I, I love it. I don't put any water in it at all. I have tried it with the water, but I just love it as it is. It doesn't overpower it, which is really good. So Me too. I like it. First time he's had it as well. So I'm glad that I can bring something to somebody that hasn't had it before. <laughs> so if you were distilling or if you were running your own whiskey company, what is a cask that you would love to try or love to do yourself? Jeez. I'm a big fan of like port cask. Mm. I love anything Madeira. So I'd kind of, and I'm, I'm always, I think I try and do something unique, you know, like I always think, you know, imagine lightly charring a port barrel or doing something like that. And, and especially with Australian red wine cast too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not too many people doing them, you know, Starwood and stuff like that, but there's pretty small scale stuff. So I'd, I'd, I'd experiment with Australian wine casts, I reckon, or even Australian oak, you know, something. Yeah. I, I know New Zealand have like a, a pretty rare oak that they're starting to 
dabble with at the moment. So I think I'd try and do something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same. It's port, wine cask is, is really where I love my, my yep. kind of thing. And having that um, charred Star Ward from the Whiskey Club was exactly. pretty amazing. And yeah. if you're watching this, this will be out before the whiskey list. We probably shouldn't advise you, but there is a, I think it's cask strength. It's 54%. Uh, coming up this week, it's pretty much the same. It's just ten percent stronger. Yeah. Um, so I missed, I missed out on the first one. Too. Oh, did you? Yeah. I should have brought that down. I was looking at it, going, "No, you would have already had it." So never had it. Um, this <laughs> one is a very limited. There's three hundred and forty-eight bottles on available, and there's something like five thousand members with the whiskey club. So good luck trying to get that on I can Friday morning. Four of them are going to be gone already. So yeah, 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 yeah that's, 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 that's exactly right. So. So um, what's the future for you? Like, what are you doing now? And what are you doing now? You're back in Australia. Basically, trying to ride out this pandemic, firstly, and uh, hopefully get back to a, to a bit more travel and focus more on the on the social media. But at the moment, I'm doing some uh, tastings for for Bladnock and Pure Squid at the moment. So I'll be floating around all the uh, vintage sellers in Queensland and uh, Dan Murphy's and First Choices and stuff like that. And yeah, cool. Doing a couple of events that are coming up. So you might see me around if you're in Queensland or anything like that. Come say hey. Yeah, well, it's as I said, a bit hard to travel in uh, yeah. Yeah, New South Wales and for that. Exactly, so, so, again, at the moment, right now, um, we'll do a bit of a shout out to Bladnock. As you always know, I've got a lot of love for these guys. Currently, the 10 year old is $80, so about a $20 saving at Dan Murphy's um, Day, yeah. until Father's Day. And Vinch's Sellers has the 11 year old at 80 bucks as well instead of $100. And I think that's a fa until Father's Day as well. Whole yeah. um, of September, I think, actually. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, cool. So. so, I haven't got any of the 11 year olds. So I'm going to go grab one before it goes up in price. But um, yeah. make sure you get that. So, um, you what? How did you connect with Bladnock? Because obviously we've got a mutual love. I've got a, a, a massive hate for you for not picking my photos for the, um, the bicentennial <laughs> um, award, but we won't get into that. We'll do that off camera. Um, <laughs> we'll sort that out. What, what kind of um, what kind of uh, connection, or how did you kind of get into the Bladnock scene? Well, it was kind of again being at the airport. You know, Will travelled so much yep. for for Bladnock and and going overseas and doing his thing, commissioning the the distillery opening and stuff like that. That he was coming through so often that you know I became friends with him. Just you know, come to the bar, a couple of pre-flight drams and stuff like that. And then you know, I I actually met up with him at the London Whiskey Festival for one of the one of the events over there mm -hmm. as well. And then it kind of I just came back and you know it's one of those things where I, I love whiskey so much and to have them be owned by an Australian mm. like David Pryor, you know, the, the only distillery in Scotland owned by Australian, kind of nearly all based in Queensland and it's just like I'm here and it's just worked out so well and I've got so much love for him and I love history as well, you know, 203 year distillery, Yeah, just, it's crazy. They, um, um, I don't want to make it a full blood knock interview, it's not about that, but it's because obviously it's about this collection and stuff like that, but one of the things that I always say that blood knock have it right not just in the whiskey, because there's some of the stuff I actually don't enjoy, like everyone's not going to enjoy certain things, um, enjoy most of it, but it's about the service that I've got. They're creating a bit of a family, a bit of a buzz, and, and really making sure that their client is taken care of, which is really strange, because I can guarantee you if it was any other whiskey company, big company, uh, small stuff, obviously I, I get that, they will do the same thing, but it's big companies, they generally go, oh well, broken bottle, sorted out at the post exactly. office. You know, Will yesterday, it wasn't their fault at all, um, Australia Post broke a bottle of mine, uh, Will was at my office less than an hour later with that bottle going, here's a replacement, don't even worry about it. Um, you don't get that with anyone else. Exactly. And, and I think that's just, I, I have a really good sweet spot because customer service is one thing that I, you know, really work on with my business and things like that. So when I see that from someone else, and it's like going to a restaurant. Yep. You might go to the best restaurant in the world, right? And they give you crappy service or they're snobby or you sitting there by yourself. And if you travel by yourself, you would know exactly what this 100%. is like. Travel by yourself, go into a restaurant and they put you in the shittest spot possible, right? Yep, always. And everything makes it, make, everything from there just is downhill. But yep. it's the best food you probably tasted, but the experience brings it down. So you don't even remember the food, you, you, you remember the experience. Yep. When you go to a mediocre place, but the experience is awesome, you go, holy crap, you've got to go to this place. 100%. And you don't even know it. And that's what I'm feeling about with Blood Knock and the, and the whiskey with that. It really does heighten the, the experience when, and the enjoyment with that as well it's like so. 50% of you is is the experience that makes Correct. you want to enjoy it more that's it yep. yeah and as it they're Australian as well exactly. so um I said like what's what's kind of the future once all of this is done what's your ultimate job to be doing in the whiskey industry <sighs> Jeez, I, I, you know I, I'd love to be you know master blender or something like yep. that you know experimenting experimenting with the barrels and 
different strengths and stuff like that. So that'd be the absolute ultimate goal, but I just have no idea how I'd get into yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, and you know what? Talking to, to a couple of people that are in that, they've all kind of just happened to stumble into that yeah, position. Yeah. They're not like, that was never their plan. It was just kind of, they just knew the right people and they hung out with the right people and they started working at, at the lower end and they just got their position. So exactly. it looks like you're either going to have to go down to Tasmania and work for them or, um, you know, to move UK. to the UK, either yeah. one, but um, COVID's going to be a bit of an interesting one there. Mate, Thank you for joining us. Um, It's been, we've been trying to catch up for a bit of time. Obviously you've been busy. I've been quite busy as well, but this is an absolute pleasure to, you know, yeah. And see someone's collection as amazing as this. So um, through the video, I would have done some B-roll. You would have seen some of the stuff, but you know, this guy has got so much that it's not even here. It's in in another um, storage thing, but what are you going to do? What's the, um, when you get your next house, you're going to have a nice big vault or something like that that no one can get into? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to need a museum soon or yeah. something like that or start selling it or just <laughs> stop with my obsession. But uh, I, I've always had high expectations for, you know, my, my own place and have a whiskey sort of room slash display museum. So kind of that's, that's always in the back of my mind that that's what I'm looking for next. I think, my place, so. I think everyone watching these is going, yep, we want a room just for whiskey <laughs> yeah, as well. Exactly. So. so, mate, thank you again for joining no us. Worries, mate. Thank you again, everybody on there. And as always, if you have any questions you want to be asked, uh, want me asking people, make them in the comments below. And if you've got anyone that you actually want to interview, if it's local in Brisbane or Sunshine Coast, Queensland, I'm happy to drive to them. Um, but I want to be interviewing people and really seeing their story about whiskey. So, mate, again, thank you. And my cheers. Pleasure. I've run out. Cheers. Me too. We've both run out. We're going to go have another whiskey. See you guys.